thank you very much, Vidas, and thank you all for coming this morning. It's a, it's a genuine honour to be here and talk to you all. Uh, I must say, like Professor Mark Kahn yesterday morning, I would ask to uh, at least um, ask your indulgence, well, my indulgence in a new topic. Uh, I have, as um, Vidas has mentioned, worked extensively in different contexts, research contexts outside of Europe, Africa, and China, and I've spoken about them quite extensively um, at my university at UCL, uh, but also in Kaunas here, and I wanted to do something different today. I will be talking about them, but I want to talk about them in the context of the 21st century, and particularly where Kaunas is going, both in its aspirations for UNESCO World Heritage listing, but also as a city that is, uh, I, I think, inevitably going to develop uh, quite rapidly perhaps in the early 20th century and how that process should be conducted when thinking about modernism in the past. So I'll be dealing with modernism. I define the 21st century in the context of the Anthropocene and this new geological age and that's where for me it's a really exciting new research territory so that's where I um, to say is, is new for me and, and um, I hope that makes it somehow interesting and contextual for you. But I also want to mention the new <coughs> approach within UNESCO called HUL. Some of you will not be familiar with HUL, which stands for Historic Urban Landscapes. It's a new approach, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I want to combine these three themes um, this morning. Broadly speaking, what I'm talking about is modern heritage of the present, um, how we deal with modern heritage in the present, and modern heritage for the future, which I think is really appropriate um, for Kaunas uh, in the current time. Now, as Vidas mentioned, I'm director of the a new master's program, um, Architecture and Historic Urban Environments at UCL, at the Bartlett School of Architecture. And we're very fortunate to be invited uh, here in Kaunas over the summer to participate in their summer school, their first summer school, which was very exciting, because we are working very much in that third life that um, Ines Weissman talked about yesterday, where we're taking the modernism of the past and thinking about how to use it in the future. So it's taking a very different and quite radically different I have, approach to the way UNESCO have conventionally dealt with heritage, not to see museums as cities, but as places of inspiration, innovation, and creativity, to use that modernist heritage in a creative manner. Uh, Vidas also very kindly, generously mentioned that some of the books that I've written, I just I, I show these only to give you an idea of the, the uh, for me, the importance of a global spread of research in the 21st century. Architectural history has tended to be quite territorial in the 20th century. The 21st century, I think, it needs a, a more global approach. We talked about this yesterday in relation to national modernisms and multiple modernities. Um, so I've worked predominantly in Africa and China, of course, some aspects in Asia, um, in, in, um, sorry, Africa and Asia more broadly, some contexts in Europe and Britain too. What I suppose encapsulates um, the kind of narrative that I would challenge is this image. Some of you will be very familiar with it. It's the tree of architecture that appeared in Sir Bannister Fletcher's History of Architecture, the seminal text written in the late 19th century on architectural history, where the trunk is Western architecture. Now, of course, this is outdated. It's over 100 years old. But all the sub-branches are every other architecture. And continents like Africa, which now have 54 countries, aren't even... Um, aren't even in the tree, let alone on the grass that's surrounding it. So this is a sort of narrative that I think has, has had a huge impact on the way architectural history has been written in the 20th century, um, but I think is, is clearly changing, and the discussions yesterday were most certainly evidence of that. I will come back to the Bannister Fletcher's text in a short while. Vidas also mentioned that I was involved in Asmara's nomination for UNESCO. Um, my work in Asmara goes back about 20 years now, but Eritrea is a, is a country that has certainly been overlooked um, across all sorts of disciplines, but it's certainly in architectural history, has a very rich architectural history, which until recently features in no architectural history book. So for me, intellectually, it was important to engage in a country like that um, outside of, of Europe, but also it warrants attention on the world stage. In 2017, this nomination um, was inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. The team that I work with in Asmara also, as Vidas mentioned, were awarded the RIBA President's Medal for their research, which is the highest accolade in British research, so um, we're very, very proud of them in Asmara. Just to give you a slight flavour of the other work that I've done in, in Asia, my most recent, actually my 
previous book, um, is Ultramodernism, Architecture, Modernity in Manchuria. This is looking at the Japanese empire in northeast China before the Second World War, which is very interesting when we look at global histories of modernism because it deals with a country which is not of the West, but sought empire like most of the European countries, but imposed that on its, on its Asian neighbor. So the modernism that occurred in Manchuria they tried to distinguish from the European modernism, and they called it ultra-modernism. It was more modern than the, Europe, the, uh, than the modernism you would find in Europe. And this was awarded the RBA President's Medal last year. So just to put this work into sort of a theoretical context, yesterday we talked about multiple modernities, and I just wanted to um, draw attention to the origins of that theory. Um, I was talking to Mark Princeton this morning about where that term, or when that term originated. Um, as far as a theoretical approach is concerned, it started with uh, the social scientist Shmuel Eisenstadt in, um, in Jerusalem University. And in, the, in 1998, it was first posited as the uh, uh, sort of theory of early modernities, it was called. Looking at modernities outside of Europe, outside of the canon, but before the 20th century. And in that, they noted that it's a fact that Asia, like Africa and Latin America figures less in major scholarly terms than do either Europe or North America. And this brings us very close to the debate on Orientalism. For me, working in China, um, it's where I did my PhD many, many years ago, this was the closest I could get to a theory that made sense. That here was, in, in the Chinese context, was a modernism which had very little to do with the modernism in Europe. Um, but there was nothing written about it, certainly in architectural terms. So this theory resonated very strongly with my experiences in research in China. In terms of resonating with Orientalism, of course, most people will be familiar with Said's seminal text, and he describes Orientalism as a Western style for dominating and having authority over the Orient. The idea of a European identity as a superior one in comparison with all other non-European peoples and cultures. Of course, this has had a profound impact on post-colonial studies and many other uh, disciplines. But again, if, I look, if we look back to Manchuria, it complicates this question. Uh, and of course, there have been many developments on Orientalism since it was published. But in Manchuria, it wasn't a Western style. It was an Eastern style within the East. So there are different territories um, that, we're, that we're dealing with now. And, and understanding better, as was discussed yesterday, as we get to understand much more <coughs> about those histories that have been overlooked by the master narrative. Two years after Early Modernities was published then, the... the um, Daedalus, the title of the, of the journal, was Multiple Modernity. So this was the first outing, really, of that, of that uh, theory. And as I mentioned yesterday, one of the, the sort of central tenets of that was that one of the most important implications of the term multiple modernities is that modernity and westernization are not identical. There are other forms of modernity, um, and within that, different modernisms um, that are not to do with aspiring to be like the West, of the West. Um, and this is gaining... Um, quite significant um, traction outside of, outside of Europe now in intellectual studies in architecture, which couldn't have been said probably 10 or 15 years ago. So this is a, um, a publication, a conference publication from Singapore in 2012, Non-West Modernist Past, in which they state Western mainstream literature on modern architecture and urbanism continues with its Eurocentric universality and dominance. Even significant contributions of the non-West are considered peripheral and ignored. So from the Singaporean perspective, or the Asian perspective, it's very difficult to talk about your architectural history on, this, on a level playing field with all the research and all the knowledge that is produced in the West. But it's changing. We can see that in African modernism, which was published only three years ago, where they make the bold and, and I, quite, I think quite right claim that Europe can no longer claim exclusive rights to modernity. And going slightly further back in 2009, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture was given to the book Multiple Modernities in Muslim Societies. So things are changing, and they're changing for the better. Outside of the realm of modernism, though, I just want to deal with the, notion, the, the wider notion of culture in which this modern architecture, of course, is situated. And look at the UNESCO World Heritage List as a sort of, as, um, as a global um, a list of, of obviously of cultural sites which claim to have outstanding value to humanity and importantly irrespective of the territory on which they're located so it shouldn't matter whether it's from the west whether it's europe north america 
or elsewhere in the world, if they are of outstanding value to humanity, they should be on the World Heritage List. If that is so, then it's strange that Europe should have 424 cultural sites compared to Africa, which has only 85. If you make the rules, and you play by those rules, and you have the resources to play by those rules, then you inevitably benefit from those rules that you've created. And Africa, of course, is a loser in that process. Now, UNESCO acknowledge this. They know it's a problem, and they're doing their best to try and resolve it. But it does reflect a problem that occurred in the, that we sort of we created in the 20th century, where things were dominated by a Western narrative. If we map that, we can see you know, a continent the size of Africa, with 1.2 billion people, 54 countries, has less sites than Italy and Spain combined. Cultural sites, we're not dealing with natural sites here. So there, there clearly is a problem. But we're moving in the right direction in trying to remedy that problem in the 21st century. We can also see legacies of this problem of Western centricity in, for example, ICOMOS, the modern movement. This was published this year, dealing with modernism. Um, but it still talks in terms of there being a sort of a, or the implication there is a singular movement. It doesn't acknowledge the multiplicity or the plurality of modernism. It's still dealing in these tw quite 20th century narratives. I've tried to tackle this in, in my work and my writing, and I just want to, um, if you, self referentially if you'll forgive me, quote something from um, the RIBA journal last year. History is a record of power. The 20th century, which is modernism's century, was dominated by the West, its official history bearing testimony to the West's dominance of others, such as Africa and Europe. Modernist architectural history is a canon constructed by, for, and of the West. This has major consequences for architectural encounters with modernity outside the West, which are routinely overlooked or poses um, an assumed inferiority postulation asserted through inauthenticity, belatedness, dilutedness, or remoteness, geographically, intellectually, or even racially. So modernism that occurred outside the West was always seen as, well, it happened afterwards, it was somehow belated, or it's inauthentic because it's, it's not quite of the Bauhaus style, it's, it's the derivation of, um, or it's quite far away from Central Europe, so we'll, or Western Europe, so it's somehow seen as geographically remote. And these, of course, do take on quite important um, implications for, in all manner of disciplines. I want to quote another author, um, an Indian author, and I, I think it encapsulates what we're trying to do here. The project is not to celebrate and give voice to minority discourses and, and knowledges in order to include them in a subordinate position um, into existing privilege accounts of modernity but we need to question the master narrative. And I think that is something that is certainly happening in the 21st century and in the lives of most of the students in this room will probably be fulfilled in their lifetime, I hope so. And Eisenstadt, to, to continue with multiple modernities, this book was published in 2003, uh, optimistically hoped that studies of the future are likely to take into greater account societies, religions, traditions and practices still too little known today, concealed um, from the West by many factors. I hope that's true, but I want to return to the history of architecture by Bannister Fletcher, which is currently being rewritten, totally rewritten. Um, and I've been involved in the rewriting of this book. Um, it's an incredibly ambitious task. The editor is a, is a good friend and colleague of mine who's taken on the task halfway through a process that was set up in a structure which I believe represents a slightly outmoded style of architectural history. And if I can just describe this a bit like the UNESCO World Heritage List, if we break down the word count that was allocated to different territories, the blue area here is Europe, the purple area at the top is uh, Africa, and the green area is China. This is in the age of the Enlightenment from 1400 to 1830. So 5,000 words was dedicated to Africa. I wasn't involved in this section of the book, but I was asked to write the chapters for China and Africa from 1830 to the present day, so it involved four chapters. In trying to do that then, this is the period of 1830 to 1914, which are dates that are completely irrelevant to China and Africa. China was given 4,000 words compared to Europe's 35,000 words, and China, Africa, as I say, a continent of 54 countries, was given 5,000 words. So to try and write a history of a continent in 5,000 words in a span of nearly a century is, of course, impossible. If we bring up to the modern period, the 20th century, 
the problem still prevails. 38,000 words for Europe. Eastern Europe gets 14,000. China just gets nine, a continental-sized country. Um, and Africa still gets just five. It's as if architecture doesn't happen in the continent of Africa. So why modernism? We've obviously all come to this, this conference because we're interested in, in what modernism is, what it represents. And for me, it's about the 20th century. And uh, in dealing with modernism in the present, we're looking forward to the 21st century. So this is why I'm interested in the Anthropocene. The reason the 20th century is so critical, I've tried to encapsulate four broad themes. Firstly, the population boom of our species. It quadrupled over the century from about 1.6 billion to 6.1 billion. And since the end of the 20th century, it's risen by another 1.5 billion. So this is a fundamental change. And I'll come on to that in a bit, just trying to describe how big that change is. And I think we can overlook that in many cases. Of course, one of the consequences of that is we've become an urbanised species. Now, we actually became urbanised in the 21st century, but the process, of course, was well underway throughout the 20th century. Um, so from 1950, there were 751 million people living in cities. In the present day, there's 4.2 billion. So an astronomical expansion of cities throughout the 20th century. Culturally, we're dealing with the unification of humankind. In the 20th century, or the start of it, there were human settlements, human communities that had absolutely no contact or no wish to contact other human settlements or, um, or communities in the world. Now, there is not a single community that isn't affected by other human communities. We have become a global community, and that's intertwined in so many ways, of course. Um, sometimes I think we can overlook that in architectural terms, but of course in finance, um, in, in environmental conditions, of course, it's, it's unavoidable. And then lastly, modernism. I think we are moving from a, a notion of a singular modernism to a, a more plural, pluralistic approach to multiple modernities and understanding the intricacies, the nuances of how modernity was experienced in different cultures around the world. So this can be encapsulated, as I say, by this geological change um, to the Anthropocenic age. Scientists have long debated whether we've entered the Anthropocene, but in recent years they've agreed that it has happened. When it happened is still up for debate, but some scientists suggest that it was in the New Mexican desert when we first dropped the atomic bomb, which sent radioactive isotopes all around the world, and therefore our impact on the world became truly global. This is a picture of, not of New Mexico, uh, the test site, but of Nagasaki um, at the end of the Second World War. The bomb was dropped just minutes after Manchuria and the Empire of Japan and China collapsed um, at the end of the Second World War. So this, for me, brings to an abrupt end this, this age of empire for Japan in China, so it resonates with, with my work there. But it symbolically represents, I think, the start of a new geological age, which temporarily I will talk about in a minute. When we deal with urbanization, we're dealing with cities which are fundamentally different from anything that's ever happened on this planet. So this is a picture of Shanghai from the Shanghai fin World Finance Center, a city of now 25.4 million people. And then we deal with global culture. What happens when we become a global species? Uh, what happens to our individual cultures? Um, will they become homogenized? I think that's, that's almost impossible and extremely unlikely. Um, but we are dealing with uh, a global perspective as opposed to a more nationalistic or perhaps continental perspective, which comes back to Mark's points yesterday about internationalism. Maybe there's a new sort of planetary consciousness rather than a sort of a, a, something based on nationhood, which is quite a 19th century um, phenomenon. Now, if we look at this in terms of what do these cities look like, you know, when we urbanise, when the 20th century has had this enormous impact, what does it actually look like? This is a picture of Asmara in 1889. Um, this is Ras Alula's hut, the, the prince Alula. Um, there was a small village on the plateau of Asmara. By 1938, the Italians were planning quite substantial cities. It had developed quite a lot throughout the 1920s and 30s. And of course, in 2017, it becomes a World Heritage Site as a, as a, whole, as a whole urban landscape with its central zone, its core zone, and its buffer zone around it. In dealing with that complexity of a whole city site, we're not dealing with a single building or an artifact, um, you've got to break that down. But we have the tools now, we have the technological tools to deal with cities um, on the, and this degree of complexity. But Asmara is a relatively, um, a relatively small capital city by African standards. In 1939, there was 98,000 people living in Asmara. Today, there's 0.8 million. Um, the government has a policy of decentralization, unlike most African countries. 
So it's done quite well to suppress the urbanisation of a city and, and, and encourage the growth of other cities in Afri in, in, within Eritrea. That's not the same in most African countries. But Uganda, um, in Kampala, for example, there were 60,000 people in, in Kampala in, independence in 1962 and now 1.5 million. In Ouagadougou, in Burkina Faso, it's gone from 30,000 in 54 to 2.2 million. In Addis Ababa, next to Asmara, it's gone from 80,000 in the 30s to 3.4 million. The scale of this development is phenomenal, and it's easy to throw out these numbers, but unless you go to these cities, it's, it's hard to imagine what that means to the infrastructure, to the people, and for architecture and heritage. Abidjan in Côte d'Ivoire, 40,000 in 1940 to 4.4 million. Dar es Salaam in Tanzania from 6, 685, quite a substantial city, but now 4.4 million. And then Kinshasa, it's now a city of 10 million, which is the world's largest French-speaking city, which then throws into question these notions of, of culture and language. Um, one wouldn't imagine that the largest French-speaking city is actually in Africa. And funny enough, just two days ago, the Financial Times um, had an article on African cities. Of the 30 fastest growing cities in the world today, 21 of them are in Africa. And if we map that over the next 17 years or so, up to 19, uh, sorry, 2035, the percentage change in urban growth is phenomenal when we look at the African context. Even the Asian context, which has already done enough in the 20th century, is still continuing to grow. When we look at Europe and Oceania, it's, it's relatively small. But Africa is the next place to really undoubtedly boom. So the other context I would like to look at is the Chinese, um, given the research that I've done there. In 1896, the Trans-Siberian Railway was built from uh, St. Petersburg across the Vladivostok. Um, and it was said at the time that it was one of the greatest arteries of traffic the world has ever seen, and one of the chief factors in shifting the center of gravity of the world's trade. The eventual effect will be colossal. That's perhaps an understatement. Um, given what has occurred in Manchuria and China ever since, but also the transformation that railways brought around the world um, over the 20th century. In 1898, the Russians built a branch line from the Trans-Siberian down to the Chinese coast. They wanted access to an ice-free port. At the T-junction, they built Harbin, or they established Harbin. Harbin today is a city of 10.6 million people. It didn't exist 120 years ago. At the end of that branch line, they built Dalian, the new port, of 6.7, is now a city of 6.7 million people. And these cities have very interesting cultural and architectural heritage. Uh, this, these are Art Nouveau buildings built by Russian railway workers in Harbin in 1903. And the Russians were the first to produce modern or implement modern urban plans in China. And this is on the left, Harbin, the modern plan for Harbin, and on the right, the modern plan for Dalian. In 1905, the Russians lost the war with Japan, so Japan acquired Dalian and subsequently developed the city under their new empire. This is an image of Dalian, though, in 1903, um, and it was said by critics at the time that it was a boom town without any reason for a boom. But coming back to the 21st century, if we look at other cities, Shanghai, 24.5 million, Hong Kong, 7.3 million. Guangzhou, 14.5 million, and Shenzhen did barely existed 25 years ago, is now 12.5 million. We've so fundamentally transformed our, um, our territories and our cities over the last century. And in trying to grasp the enormity of that, and this is where um, I'd like to take my research in the, in the sort of immediate future, is trying to think of it in geological time. If we've entered a new geological age, what does that look like? How do we try and grasp the enormity of, of that change? This tries to map the history of the Earth, and if we look at the infinitesimally small speck of time that humans have populated this planet, it barely features in the very topmost slice of that circle. Um, if we look at the dinosaurs, um, occupy about half that red line, and then it's mammals thereafter. So we have been on this planet for a tiny period of time. And trying to get your head around this, I found this cartoon online which I thought sort of succinctly sums up how one feels about the Anthropocene. It sort of sends you back to a gibbering, childish wreck. So, just thinking about that slice, that human slice, taking that slice as, and this is to scale, these, these, um, the area of these circles are, are to scale, they're proportionate to their time. Humans arrived on the Earth two and a half million years ago. 
that's all human, different human species, not Homo sapiens, that we all are, although bits of our DNA are not. Sapiens um, emerged 350,000 years ago. So we occupy quite a small part of that human experience on this planet. The cognitive revolution occurred 70,000 years ago. So we started to create stories 70,000 years ago. We talked a lot yesterday about narratives, about myths, about stories. That started 70, our ability to do that started roughly 70,000 years ago. And funnily enough, in today's Guardian newspaper, there was an article on a rock that's been found in South Africa that has drawings on it that are deemed to be 70,000 years old. So maybe this is pushing the boundaries back a little bit of the cognitive revolution. Um, but beyond our ability to tell stories and therefore form groups, um, collaborative groups, it took quite some time before the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago. And at that point, we became the only human species on the planet. All the other species by then had become extinct. Human species. 5,000 years ago, we learned to write. So between 70,000 years, we've been telling stories to one another. 5,000 years ago, we were able to write these stories down and create history. So we're engaged, obviously, in very much in history making at the moment. But that, that ability only is 5,000 years old. It's an extraordinary short period of time. We also, at that time, invented coinage, monetary um, systems, and kingdoms. And then, of course, the scientific revolution is only 500 years old, and the 21st century, the 20th century, is just 118 years old. So it's a tiny speck in the human experience on this planet. But what an impact it has had over the last century! If we look at the population rise of our species since the agricultural revolution, this exponential rise in population and the impact that has on our planet is, is almost unimaginable. Within that population growth, urbanization, of course, is a, is a very important phenomenon. We're dealing with modern cities, modern cities that, that were dealing with, whether it's Harbin, Dalian, Kaunas, uh, Asmara, they were dealing with this urbanization, uh, this population growth in the 20th century. We became urbanized around about 2006, 2007. As the urban population grew, of course, the rural population declined. In Lithuania, this is a graph of... Um, of urbanization in Lithuania. It occurred actually in the early 1970s, so you, become, you became an urban society relatively early compared to the um, global average. So where does this leave us in terms of the 21st century? Um, the World Urbanization Prospectus by the UN um, deals with sustainable urbanization and deems it um, absolutely key, fundamental to successful development. If we're going to succeed in developing over the 21st century and beyond. And it, to quote, as the world continues to urbanize, sustainable development depends increasingly on the successful management of urban growth. Urban growth is closely related to the three dimensions of sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental. And then of course, in Kaunas, we're dealing with all those three, and I would urge the municipal authorities here and the cultural authorities and the national and local governments to really think long and hard about these, these principles and these concepts as they go forward, not only just for, for the, urban, the development of Kaunas, but for UNESCO World Heritage listing. And of course, fundamental to all of this, and this is why we're here, I think, in this, in this conference, is dealing with modernist heritage um, as a product of the 20th century. Whether it's dealing with, say, for example, Tel Aviv as a whole urban landscape, this is the white city on the right-hand side, um, quite literally the white city, the cloud was shadowing the rest of the city. We've got Kaunas, um, the different modernisms we find in China, for example. This is Nairobi. This is Gdynia. This is Britain. This is Paranu, it was shown yesterday, the great mushroom that um, was uh, spoke about by Marx yesterday morning, and Asmara. So there, of course, there are literally thousands of cities that one could um, cite in terms of their experiences and the cultural heritage, the legacies of those cities in the 20th century, and what we do with them in the 21st century. But all of this, I think, is dependent on one thing, and Yuval Noah Hariri, some of you will be, well, I think most of you will probably be familiar with his work now, it's a very popular and very well told story of the growth of the um, Homo sapiens as a species, and in the second book, Homo Deus, deals with the future of our species. But the real nemesis, he cites, of the modern economy, um, and I think of modern cities, is ecological collapse. Whether we can cope with a systemic ecological collapse in the 21st century. As architects, maybe we don't see that as our responsibility, but cities, of course, have to become more sustainable. We have to deal with ecology in the cities, not just see it as something that happens outside. 
Architects are engaging with this, though not, not as many as perhaps we'd like. And this is perhaps the only book that deals full on or full frontal with the Anthropocene. And it cites that architects must choose to either continue contributing to the problems that we've created in the 20th century or dedicate themselves to finding novel ways of, of adaptation. So that, again, I think is a challenge for a lot of us in the room, practitioners here, um, and thinking about countless in the 20th, 21st and 22nd centuries and beyond. We have some tools to deal with this. The um, UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, goal number 11, deals with sustainable cities and communities, the orange square on the, on the right there. And the new urban agenda, which I think Mike Turner will be talking more about um, was, was ratified about two years ago, end of 2016. So there are, there are, of course, there's an awful lot of work being done in this field. But in the cultural sector, I think we lack the tools currently um, to deal perhaps more collaborative, collaboratively to, with each other, but also with the systems in place and the, perhaps the new systems that we need to devise to deal with the problems that we face in the 21st century. And that brings me on to my last point about historic urban landscape. So what is this approach? I don't want to go into detail about defining it now, but the brief definition says, historic urban landscape is the urban area understood as the result of a historic layering of cultural values and attributes, extending beyond the notion of a historic centre, or ensemble, to include the broader urban context and its geographical setting. So it's dealing with cities in a much more complex manner than we did in the 19th century, and certainly in the, also the 20th century. Uh, we have the technological tools to deal with that. We have the understanding now to begin to deal with this the complexity of all the things that contribute to what constitutes a modern city in the 21st century. But managing it will, of course, be a major challenge. In terms of HUL, we had a forum at the Bartlett School of Architecture last year, um, brought together different experts from all around the world. Um, and this is something that we're trying to push forward in, in Shanghai. Um, Mike here can be seen in the, in the front row. We had a meeting in, in March dealing with the Southeast Asia Pacific region. And then in Tel Aviv in June this year, we, um, we had a gathering of modern cities. And of course, Kaunas participated very actively in that, in that forum. And it was an idea generated by a number of different modern cities who are trying to to think about and deal with modern cities as heritage of the past, but also as, as important sites of development and sustainable development in the future. So modern cities reporting sort of proposed this notion of a network of, of modern cities or modern cities. And Kaunas agreed to, to host the first official forum in Kaunas next year. So that's really exciting that Kaunas is actually taking a global lead in this challenge and bringing together different modern cities um, and, uh, and discussing the problems they face and working out solutions. And I hope Gdynia, who agreed to participate, um, who agreed to host in 2021, um, will, will be the second site of that forum. So it's something that is emergent, and I hope that it will continue. Just going back to Hariri's text, it needs to continue, because in his thesis, he argues that in the early 21st century, the train of progress again is pulling out of the station, probably the last train ever to leave the station called Homo sapiens. Those who ride the train of progress will acquire divine abilities of creation and destruction, while those left behind will face extinction. It's quite, quite the deliberately provocative language, but I don't think it's far off the mark in terms of our ability to defy aging, our growing ability to defy aging, what we do with a, an aging population that's already increasing um, in, the, in the early 21st century. But what we, do, what we do with, for example, the global pro proliferation of weapons of mass destruction um, in the 21st century, it's something we need to urgently think about as a global species. So just to conclude, I want to return back to one of my favourite cities, Shanghai, um, which is a genuinely modern city, whether we're dealing with the 20, early 20th century um, or the 21st century. It was a city that was established really in its, in its sort of modern form only 150 years ago but it's now a city of 24.5 uh, million people. This is a, an image of that building that I took a photo of uh, from in front of the uh, UUN Gardens, the old tea house in the centre of the old gardens. The tallest building in Shanghai, and the tallest building in China until the 1980s, was the Joint Saving Society building designed by Laszlo Udek. He was a Hungarian, uh, and he travelled to China after the First World War. He was disillusioned with Europe, and he became a very prolific architect across um, Shanghai uh, 
the Joint Savings Society were a Chinese institution, a consortium of Chinese institutions <coughs> in the, in the, just before the war that managed to bring together enough resources to build the tallest building in the city. It was based on the radiator building, um, which inspired UDEC. And here we can see it standing proudly in front of the, what was the race course um, in, in central Shanghai. About 15 years ago, that's what it looked like. About three years ago, that's what it looked like. And last year, that's what it looked like. So trying to deal with these cities as, as heritage um, is going to be the biggest question. We have to do it. We have no choice because the only alternative, I think, is that. And we need to obviously avoid that. So on an optimistic note, I'd just like to say thank you for giving me a platform this morning to think about um, new practical outputs of the research that I've been doing and especially to think about those in the context of Kaunas because I think it's a really appropriate city to do that in. So thank you for your time.